Hello, and welcome to Seattle interview series number nine. I have Lofa Tatupu with me, three-time Pro Bowler, first-team All-Pro, NFC champion, Seahawks 35th anniversary team, two-time AP national champion, first-team All-American, former Seahawks assistant linebacker coach, and co-founder of Zone NCB. How are you doing today, Lofa? How's things going for you? Right on, my man. I'm blessed, man. Uh, thank you for having me. Let's just get right into it. Uh, US, oh, actually, before I start with USC, I wanted to ask you about your father. Um, what was it like having a dad uh, who did spend time in the NFL, obviously? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's Mosi, Mossy? Yeah. Mosi, yep. Mosi Tatupu spent time with the Patriots. Um, and how did, you know, having him help prepare you for the career that you would have in the NFL? Well, you know, I didn't know any better, right? I thought everybody's dad played in the NFL because, I mean, I was a naive kid, right? And, uh, but then I started to understand that, um, you know, it was special and, um, and he was good. At, he was good at football. And so I always wanted to do, you know, my dad was my hero, still is. And, um, you know, I always wanted to do what he did. And so uh, I developed a passion for football very early. You know, I want to say around like five or six years old, I was watching every game I could on Saturday and Sunday, college football and then pro football. And, uh, and I got to go to a couple games every year that he was playing and, you know, he played until 80 or 91. So I was nine years old when he retired. You know, I, I remember him. Yeah. I remember him playing, you know, very well. And, uh, and so, you know, it's just something that since the time I was, uh, I think six, I was the first game I ever got to go to when I'm watching and, um, Man, the place was going crazy in Foxborough Stadium, and uh, he was making a couple big plays, and and the roar of the crowd just kind of gets to you, and you just, you know, that sticks with you. And I just, I told my mom, I was like, hey, I want to do that. I'm gonna do this when I grow up. I'm gonna play pro football, and uh, and she was really supportive of it too. So it was, um, it was definitely a big advantage having someone that had been there before, um, you know, in the household. Did so. When Super Bowl 49 rolled around, was there any sort of back and forth between you and your dad about that? Um, well, no, my, unfortunately, my dad had passed away oh, two, two years. No, don't worry about I apologize. it. Apologize. No, 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 not at all. But there was, I saw all sorts of like memes of like me and my Hawks uni and him and his Patriots uni and like my sister. Um, I think, I don't know if she got one of those half jerseys, but. Oh I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um. But yeah, so, um, you know, that was, uh, it was just good to see our teams in it. So, you know, with that being said, you know, you said you started watching the game of football at an early age. Was there anybody else that you sort of looked up to or maybe tried to emulate your game after? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I thought I was a running back because my dad was a running back, right? And so him and then um, my favorite player of all time, you know, because I loved watching him in college at Oklahoma State. And everybody, when I say that, everybody thinks Barry Sanders. But Thurman Thomas yeah, is my okay. favorite player of all time. And he he was just a year older than, than Barry. Crazy, man. They had two Hall of Famers, two of the greatest of all time, you know, in the same meeting room. And um, he got drafted to Buffalo. And so Buffalo was in conference with New England. So oh. every, uh, every year I got to go to the Buffalo game, man. And I mean... <laughs> They beat the hell out of us every year, but I mean, I got to, I got to watch my guy Thurman, and then I mean, of course they had the great teams, you know, back then. Um, so then um, he was a guy I really looked up to and wanted to be like because he could do it all. And then when I realized when I got to high school and I realized, you know what, I'm not going to be running back because they switched me to quarterback. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was thinking, I was like, well, I'm probably not going to play quarterback in the NFL, but I was playing well at linebacker at the time, so I started, you know. Guys like Junior, Ray Lewis, Erlacher was just coming on the scene. Um, but I was looking up to a lot of the, the shorter guys that, you know, like you said, I could, I could emulate. Guys that inspired me, Zach Thomas, London Fletcher, um, Sam Mills, um, Dat, Dat Wynn, you know, Dexter Coakley, all, all these guys. I saw a lot of 5'11 guys, you know, flying around and, and knocking people out. And so I was like, you know what? I could do that. I'm, I'm not going to play quarterback, you know, at the next, you know, in the NFL, but I, I can play linebacker. So getting into USC, what, what took place for you to transfer from university of Maine to USC? What, what, how did the chips fall on that? Yeah. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't highly recruited. That's how I ended up in Maine. And then 
after one year, I, you know, I played pretty well, at least I thought so. And um, well enough where I said, you know what, I can make a go of this. If the NFL is really the dream, which it was, um, I'm going to have to prove, you know, to the scouts in the NFL that I can play on the big stage because, you know, I could have had a lot of stats in, in at, at Maine for the next three years, whatever, get a, maybe get a couple trophies like player of the year or something. When I ran it, when I show up at the combine and I'm 5'11, 6 feet, you know, 240, and ran a 4840, they were just going to probably write me off. So I was like, all right, but if I put it on film that I did it at the biggest level, at the highest level, then, you know, they can't dismiss that. So I transferred. And a lot of people don't know, but originally I was supposed to go to Oregon. Um, I had I had committed, verbally committed to Oregon. They were really the only school that wanted me. Huh. A bunch of schools still told me no. Um, you know, I wanted I wanted to get to the West Coast because that's where my mom was. Uh, it was just me and my dad back east at the time. And um, and again, really, Oregon was the only school that um, had shown me interest in me, and they offered me a scholarship. And so, hmm. as I was about to take that. My dad sent one other film to Southern Cal and, um, you know, I, on the way there, I kind of like was just thinking about it. Oregon's at the top of, you know, the, the pack right now, it's going to be hard to break into that roster is what was going through my head. And SC, Pete had just got there. They went six and six. They went to like the Vegas bowl. And, and I was like, oh man, you know, I could, I could play here next year or as soon as uh, that red shirt burns, you know, because I have to sit out a year. I can play right away. And I didn't know that Pete was going to bring in, you know, top five after top five class. Like I didn't, <laughs> that didn't dawn on me, right. That he was just getting started. Oh yeah. So the wildest story of all that though, is that there was two scholarship offers left. I got one and the other one went to Frosty Rucker. My, my boy that played 14 years in the NFL, um, absolute beast. We both transferred in me from Maine, him from Colorado state. But I mean, I guess, you know, that, that, those were two good scholarship offers for them to, to just hand out at the end, right? When, when they were done with their whole class, because we, oh, yeah. we were late admits to, uh, to their class. Jeez. No, yeah, I guess uh, opportunity really presented itself for you, huh? It, well, it did, but, you know, when I got there, and like, my, like I said, I thought I was going to, you know, be able to compete right away. I was buried on the depth chart. <laughs> uh, I was... Uh, I was the third or fourth Mike linebacker. And then I was like the third will. And then the two, it was, it was like all returning guys at Mike linebacker. Um, the, the starter was leaving and then it was um, a couple, a junior and a freshman and the freshman Oscar Lua was an absolute beast. Uh, one of my boys. Um, and what happened was he got hurt. He tore his ACL. And so I was over there third string will. And I was like, Hey, can I try to play my, I'm more of a Mike linebacker. Um, can I try playing Mike, you know? Um, and so I was like, they moved me over. And since Oscar got hurt, I was a third string, second string Mike now. Um, and me and another a Juco uh, transfer battled it out and I ended up winning it, um, you know, through the spring. And, and that's how I ended up getting my start was like, so uh, yeah, so like, I, I didn't go to Oregon because I figured I'd be buried on the depth chart. Go to SC, got buried on the depth chart. <laughs> huh. Interesting how that shakes out. So you already mentioned his name once. What was your first impression of Pete Carroll when you, you know, whether it was when you first spoke to him or when you, you really arrived um, on campus? Uh, I mean, everyone's first impression, just high energy. I mean, like if it wasn't for the gray hair, I would have thought he was a he was a DB. I mean, he's just <laughs> running around, he's zipping around the office. Like, I I mean, he just I can't imagine how many calories Pete burns, you know, in a day. We gotta put a we gotta put a garment on him or something. But um, but yeah, man, just someone that truly loves what they do. I'll, I'll say that much, and I think it shows. Um, you know, and not just game day. You know, he loves the the preparation leading up to game day. So. But um, yeah, man, it, it's just funny, you know. Like I said, he was literally just bouncing around the room, just like, "Hey, hey, man, how's it going? How's it going?" You know, <laughs> doing his Pete Carroll thing, and uh, and I mean, you know, at the time, I didn't know I was going to be part of, you know, really history. Um, in, in the next two years, um, 
20, 26 games, we went 25 and one. We, uh, the one loss coming to Cal and a guy by the name of Aaron Rodgers, <laughs> triple overtime. He's pretty good. I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shoot. Yeah, no, I remember just just for a quick spot, I was at a training camp one year and I had my head turned just for the moment to talk to somebody next to me. And I'm on, you know, the I'm right on the fence at training camp and I'm hey, this it's got that white panel ball hanging over, but my head's to the side. And all of a sudden I hadn't noticed he was approaching and Pete Carroll pops up, grabs my ball like that, signs it all within a matter of that. And I turned back and I said, what happened? You know, there's a signature on my ball and he's already gone. I, I was like, but that was my only real, uh, ex- real life experience. Cause he was, like you said, he was just boom in and out. Yeah. He's, just he's, gone. he's already, he's already off to the next one. Yeah. Where we, where we at? <laughs> so, you know, that's uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, I don't think that's a disputable fact. His energy is pretty unmatched. Um, what was your combine and draft experience? Like, cause you talked about a little bit, you know, being undersized or whatever. And, um, obviously the combine and draft doesn't always go how people want it to necessarily. Um, but what was your experience like, and are there any unique or memorable moments that you have from that whole process? Um, you know, I think it was, it was a different experience. I wish I hadn't, <laughs> I wish I hadn't worked out of the combine. I wish I just saved it for the pro day. Um, cause I think I probably actually lost the, I went, I, I dropped in the draft, <laughs> huh. even though, even though I was still second round. But um, I mean, you know, it's the just a natural progression in terms of the steps that you you know you got to take to to get drafted. But you know, I left as a junior, and um, it was kind of similar when I left Maine. You know, everybody was telling me, you know, what are you doing? You don't know what you're doing. Um, you're not going to play there. And you know, when I after two years leading the team, both years in tackles, second or third interceptions each year, I was like, man, another year here isn't going to do me any good. Like it's not. It's not going to put, push my stock any higher. And um, so I made a decision to leave. And again, everybody was like, you know, you think you're ready for the NFL? And I was like, well, I mean, the, the tape suggests I am. So, you know, and uh, and that was just the thing. My heart, my heart was already in the NFL. You know, mm-hmm. we uh, when I came to SC, you know, came there to win a title, we won two. And, you know, it's like, okay, there's, you know, the – the Buckus and the Gursky, I'm not going to say it didn't mean anything to me, but was I going to win it? Who knows? You know, who knows if, if they're even going to put me up for it? I don't think I was even up for it my junior year. So, so like the only thing I was to do is chase another ring. And um, unfortunately, you know, when I, my rookie season, I got to chase one with the, with the Hawks. But um, I'd say anything memorable from the combine. Um, so, the meetings, you go, you go to all these meetings late mm-hmm. at night, right? After all the days of, you know, I mean, you're exhausted. And I think they do it purposely, like, because you've been, you've been in the, the um, hospital getting x-rays and MRIs for every kind of strain or bro- break, broken bone that you've ever had. And then it's a long day. You work out, you do the bench, you do whatever other, you know, um, workouts. And then they set the meetings up for a night because I guess, you know, huh. you want to know after all that physical training, are you still with it mentally to, to have these conversations, talk about scheme, scheme fit, game plan, all these things, you know, anything you recall from the season. So it's, it's pretty, you know, smart on their part, but um, I get out of one at like midnight and um, there's one other guy and uh, we get to the elevator and it uh, turns out it's uh, it's, uh, Adam Jones, Pac-Man. Oh, shoot. <laughs> and Pac-Man's got the biggest grin on his face. And uh, so we get into the elevator and I'm like, man, what is so funny? And he goes, I just got out of my last meeting. Um, all of them were with teams in the top, top 10 today. And he goes, I'm not going later than 10. <laughs> that was the best. That was the best. And I just, I dapped him up. I was like, congrats, man. I don't know where the hell I'm going. <laughs> but uh, that that was cool though, to see one of your brothers, you know, just, you know, a fellow, you know, um, you know, player, just be assured like, hey man, all mm-hmm. the hard work, everything we've gone through, 
it, it's 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 been worth it because uh, I mean the smile on his face, the prices, I can still see it, man. I mean it was hilarious. <laughs> and then when he told me, I was like, damn. I was like, I not one person told me they wanted to draft me in, in the meeting. Wow. <laughs> in that in my meetings that night. So I mean, and even half of the guys that I talked to that night, like none of them even needed a linebacker. So I was just like, huh. what am I doing in here? Yeah, because I knew their rosters. I did my homework. Yeah. So so that was the most memorable. And then draft day, the most memorable. We had a great party um, in Oceanside, California on the beach. One of my dad's uh, roommates at USC was gracious enough to let us uh, use a spot. And so we're partying, right? Um, because I thought third round, you know, every, all the draft experts were saying fifth, sixth. And, like, it was to the point where, like, my mom and my dad were like, hey, you sure you even want to have a party on the first day? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't, and I just straight up said, I, I don't give a shit. I don't care if I don't get drafted. I'm gonna, as long as I get a free agent, you know, invite to, to someone's camp, I'm gonna make it. I just yeah. need the opportunity. That was the mindset. But so what I didn't check was we didn't have cell service. So oh, that was, that was a big problem. Um, but I think it worked out the best way because we're all just sitting around the TV and it's getting, it's in the middle of the second round. And like, you know, I'm starting to say like one of my dad's friends, he goes, Hey, all I'm saying, he's from Hawaii, uncle Jack. He goes, all I'm saying is I heard second round Seattle. And I was just like, I haven't talked to Seattle this entire off season. Like huh. they, they came to my pro day, but a, a couple, a lot of people did. Cause we had Mike Patterson, Sean Cody. We had some, some big guys that, that, that were, you know, going to go first round and early second. And so I was like, damn, okay, we'll see. And all of a sudden Seattle trades up in the second round and my name just pops up and every, I'm talking like drinks go flying. Like it was just like, cause no one expected it. Usually you get the call. Yeah. I guess they've been trying to call me for like a half hour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I got on the phone with Holmgren, he was like, hey, man, you sure you even want to play football? Like, I, I couldn't even get a hold of you. And I was like, coach, I'll be there and let's go, you know, let's start, let's start get, getting these wins. Because, you know, that that was the mindset, like I said, you know, coming off of two natties, I was like, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start, start something special up there. And we did. Shoot. Yeah, not having cell service might, might impact that a little bit, I'd say. Um, Didn't even check for it, right? <sighs> Well, you know, live and learn, I guess. Um, getting into Seattle, kind of good segue there. Did you do anything unique at all with that first paycheck? Or was that just kind of, hey, you know, I'm going to take this and I'm going to, you know, do put it put it away somewhere, not even look at it? Uh, bought, bought a house even before I bought my first car. Because <laughs> huh. you know how real estate is up here. But yeah, right off of Rose Hill and Kirkland, um, I, bought, I bought a house. It was like a brand new development um, right off of 85th. I mean, it, yeah, beautiful little spot. Not, not, never a bad idea to have uh, shelter, you know. Um, did you have a real standout welcome to the NFL moment, something that kind of, you know, hit you in the mouth that said, hey, I'm, I'm here right now. You know, this is, this is a next step. Um, first preseason game, it was, it was kind of like I had the hit that that i'll tell you about but um when i was i told you i grew up in massachusetts and you know drew bledsoe you know former coup he was the 93 first overall pick to new england and um you know big deal right and so bill parcells was there too so I, my dad took me to camp one time and you know i was like 11 at the time yeah yeah i was like 11 years old and i brought my card he got the washington the fleer 93 with him and the Cougs uni and got him to sign it, met him. And I met Bill Parcells and I was, you know, I was like, wow, that was, that was incredible. Right. 11 years old, got to meet these two guys. My first um, preseason game was against them um, at, at Century Link or Quest at the time. And uh, Bill Parcells is coaching and Drew Bledsoe's under center. And I was like, Oh man, this is crazy. <laughs> wow. As I'm calling the play. Right. And my first, Welcome to the NFL. Big hit moment was just a play later. They ran a power and I come around the side and I thought I was just going to crush my boy Julius Jones. 
And Larry Allen comes out of nowhere and oh. just destroys <laughs> me. And I was just like, oh my God, like, what was that? Um, so the next time, and I mean, I bounced off him like five yards. I ended up making the play like five yards down the field, but I should have, I should have just ducked, dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. Should have got around him. Yeah, Larry Allen, Larry Allen will do that. Um, and he could that, run too. He was three, three thirty. Yeah. Three, oh yeah. Run. There was, uh, I don't know if you've, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, the clip of him. The Philly linebacker? The, I, th- I was a Philly. I think it was Philly. I, I, I might have confused it with uh, New Orleans, but that just well, having him chase somebody down. Linebacker, right? Yeah. yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, yeah. And even to go back to it, uh, you know, have it come full circle with Parcells and Blood. So that's, that's got to be pretty cool, you know. Oh, it was incredible. And the coolest part was after the game, I said, What's up to Drew? I mean, you know, didn't didn't bring up that, you know, I had his rookie card signed. But uh, Parcells came up to talk to me because I, I guess when he was at New England, he was coaching the linebackers and special teams. And my dad was uh, one, of, one of his best special teams players, he said. And uh, he said, hey, man, your dad, Moses, is one of my favorites. You know, tell him I said hello. And uh, he's like, and you're going to be a hell of a ball player. And I was like, oh, awesome. Like that, that was kind of a starstruck moment, right? You know, Bill Parcell is talking to you. Yeah, no, that, no, that's, that's gotta be so cool to, for, I mean, 11 years old and now you're like fast forward in the NFL and, you know, things are obviously so much different from then. 11 years later and, and Drew was still doing it and Bill was there. And I mean, yeah, it was incredible. Uh, it was, it was one of those moments that I'll always be like, wow, like the two guys I got to meet when I was 11, you know, we're, I, I'm up here with them. Like, you know, like I, I, I fought my way to get up here and, and they're still in it. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just getting here. So speaking of moments that you might remember, this, this one might stick out. Uh, did you happen to get the ball or keep the ball from your first touchdown? I'm trying to think what was my first touchdown? Uh, I don't know. The Philly one? Was I Philly? think it was that fit the, the game, that first game in 2005 against Philly. Obviously, there was that second one in 2007. I don't, uh, I'm not sure. I used to throw a lot of the footballs in the stands. <laughs> I, had, I, had a, I had a superstition that if I kept all the footballs, you know, it was going to put bad energy and say, like, I'm not going to get it. I felt like if I kept one, I wasn't going to get another one. Huh. So I just – I just threw it back, man. Um, all, all three that I had in Philly in 07, I threw into the stands. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. The only ball I kept was uh, Bobby Wagner got our first turnover when I was coaching in 2015 or 16. And, you know, I challenged the linebackers. I was like, hey, who's going to get the first, you know, turnover? Like, you know, we had been two games without a turnover. And I was like, yeah, like, you know, we're winning, but – Imagine how more, how much more we'd be winning by if we had some turnovers. Mm-hmm. And so it was something that a coach challenged me to do in 07, you know, my linebacker coach. And so I challenged the linebackers and Bobby, st- he stood up, he goes, uh, he goes, I'm going to get the first uh, turnover. And he did. And uh, he signed it and he gave it to me. So that's the only football I ever kept. Huh. Uh, hmm. Did you, okay. So no, I'm sorry. Uh, what was your relationship like? with Matt, Matt Hasselbeck, because his father, Don, was a teammate of your father's uh, during his career with the Patriots. So was there any knowledge of him prior, you know, to being teammates or what, yeah. what's your relationship like with him to this day? Oh, we're still good friends to this day. Still, you know, call and shoot texts to each other. Um, Matt, Matt's awesome. Um, and he grew up a town over from me, him and actually Norfolk, Mass. This is where my wife's from. So um we all would have went to high school together but they went to Severian you know a well-established uh private high school out there um and from there they went to Boston College but Matt's I think Matt's six six or seven years old than me and Tim's like three or four and their youngest brother Nathaniel who they were all phenomenal athletes me and Nathaniel competing against each other a lot and um and they all they all went to Boston College um and uh but yeah man I've known them my whole life uh, great people. That was, oh, I think I told you before we started recording that, you know, my dad's first jersey was yours, but that was my first jersey was that number eight. Um, 
so, you know, we talked about it a little bit, you know, coming from USC, you know, you're talking about, you know, getting those rings and you come into Seattle. I mean, that rookie year, you know, first year pro bowl, NFC champion, lead the team in tackle. What was the, what was the locker room? Like, you know, just getting there in 2005, obviously a special group. What, what was the locker room like, you know, in your experience? Uh, I don't, I don't want to say a culture change because they were knocking on the door of the conference championship. They were the the two or three years before, you know, they had won or, or split the division or or went to the playoffs. Right. Um, And, um, but the Rams, I know that the Rams was a big, you know, opponent that, I mean, I think it was, they lost three straight to them the year before, right. Two in the regular season. Then, Oh yeah. And then the home playoff game. And so, you know, I know that that was one one team that it was like marked on our schedule. Yo, these guys are done. Like they, they you know, they ran at the tops over. But um, that locker room, that was one of the most fun years of football. I mean, obviously, you know, the two natties too. Like those three years were incredible. But that 05 team, I mean, it was just like a bunch of like kids. <laughs> Like even even the even the adults, they were like just big brothers. Uh, so it was very family oriented. Like everyone hung out, um, everybody watched film together. It was just a bunch of guys that loved playing ball. You know, loved playing football together. They really um, you know appreciate each other. No one cared who got the credit as long as we got the win. Um, and that's how you know because everybody else they were. I mean, they were they were saying we don't have any stars on defense. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't care that that's, I mean, that was the opinion, you know, outside looking in mm-hmm. um, was, you know, because, mm-hmm. you know, I was proud of how our defense stepped up in the playoffs, you know, because all, all year we got the number one offense. And so let's just be honest. It's, it's easy to play with the lead. Right. And, um, but there were, there were some games where we, you know, we really, you know, we gutted out on defense, the giants uh, game that also shout out to the twelves that, you know, those 10 false starts, y'all, y'all really won that game. Um, and then um, I'm trying to think what else. There, Dallas, Dallas stands out in my mind where um, I think it was like 10 to 7 final or something like that. Babino picked off the, you know, big play Babs, the cowboy killer. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, there was some, some, those are the moments that stand out. But I mean, um, that was just the most fun year of football, I think, you know, I've ever had. It's, uh, I mean, it sounds like always, you know, when you've got a good locker room, it always is, you know, just like a big family. And that's, you know, whenever I think about football, that's always how it seems to be, you know? So I'm sure to this point, you could say that you keep in touch with a good amount of the teammates from that locker room. Oh yeah. A bunch of them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me to say that, um, about the defense not getting much credit, but I mean, it makes sense because in, you know, Seattle, we don't always get the necessary credit, obviously, uh, just because that's not necessarily East coast, but I don't know when I was growing up, you know, I do remember, you know, Kelly Herndon and Marcus Trufant and uh, shoot Michael Bulware. I always remembered Michael Bulware. I don't remember why, um, but I don't know. Those I get obviously from here probably makes more sense to me, you know, but I mean, it, it, it's interesting seeing that perspective, um, in your mind, uh, we talked about Philly a little bit, obviously, but obvi- I'm sure you get asked about those, you know, those games a decent amount. Cause I mean, three picks in a game is its own special thing, but to do it twice. Uh, but in your personal opinion, right. Do you have a game that you would consider to be your most complete game all around? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I would have to point to the Philly game just because um, I missed the only because I was always critical of you know the, there's plenty of you know sacks interceptions and all those big plays or whatever but uh, I was always critical of my mistakes you know and I think in that game I only had two mistakes one was missing a sack missing a tackle which was a sack. Uh, I got I got blocked. I got to give credit. I think it might have been was it Reno Mahi? I think he might have got me, but um, I thought I was coming clear, and, I, and it got me. And it just got out of my reach. Um, and then I missed one other tackle. And so I mean, you know, there was other than that, there were there were no mental errors. There were no missed assignments. And 
you know, there's there's a lot of that stuff that goes on in games that fans don't see. Like, um, and like, but like for I was, man, I was on one in that game. That was, that was probably the best performance. I had one other game similar in college um, against uh, Oregon State, where it was like 14 tackles, two interceptions, a fumble, forced fumble. Um, yeah. And so, like, it's it's just one of those moments where you're in the zone, right? You just, you know, you can't miss. And so, those those are special games. And I think, um, yeah, those are my most complete performances. I mean, it's never uh, a bad thing to be critical of mistakes. You know, that's how we learn. You know, well, it's the only way you get better. Oh yeah, so, oh yeah. Don't because I mean, why? Like, there's, there's a lot. I remember talking to Dave Wyman after the game. And he, you know, he used to play linebacker. And he said, man, that's probably one of the greatest games I've ever seen a linebacker play. You know, and I said, yeah. And he was like, yeah, what? And I was like, I missed, I missed two, two big plays. And, uh, and, and he, he smiled because he knew, he knew, he, he knew that feeling. He's like, he goes, I know what you mean. And so he used to, we always joke that being a, a middle linebacker, it's a tortured existence, right? You know, um, you're never going to play. You're never going to play a perfect game. You know, even like baseball, you can play a perfect, you can pitch a perfect game, right? You could go five for five with all bases reached and, and not have an error. You could play a perfect game. Uh, basketball. I mean, I'm sure it's happened, not on a huge scale, but I'm sure guys have gone 10 for 10 or, you know, 12 for 12 and made all their foul shots. But football, you can't play a perfect game, man. You, you just can't. And so, um, that's that's one of the things is you know how much of a competitor are you where even your best performance you look back at it kind of like yeah it was all right it was all right <laughs> never want to at least i've always thought about it, is you never want to stay complacent you always want to continue to be able to grow and say hey what could i have done better so you know always. i don't think that's a bad bad thing to bad thing to think about um it, it honestly is the reason i reached the nfl I mean, because like I said, you know, I wasn't the biggest, wasn't the fastest, wasn't the strongest. So I had to work the hardest and I had to be most critical about my game myself. Oh yeah. Um, now I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you a question that asks you to compare. I don't know how much you like comparing, but between the 2005 team and, you know, that other playoff run in 2010, what differences could you see between those, those teams, not necessarily the runs themselves, obviously, you know, reaching the Super Bowl is a different thing, but that lot, what was the lot difference in the locker room? Cause obviously, you know, guys leave every year throughout just in a single year throughout the NFL, obviously uh, we're recording this a day after the first day of free agency where, you know, things are flying around. What would you say stuck out to you the most uh, in terms of differences between 2010 you know, going and beating the Saints and then playing the Bears the next week. And then obviously that 2005 Super Bowl team. Yeah, I mean, there was there was a lot of continuity. There was, you know, we didn't have many roster transactions in 05, not a ton. Like in 10, we set John and Pete's first year, we set the record like oh, all yeah. time. I think it was like 250 roster transactions over the course of a year. And I'm just, it was so honestly, like you, you didn't know who was going to be in the locker room in the, in the locker next to you. So it was just like, Oh, Hey man, you know, how's it going? Come back. You come back next week. New guy. Where'd my guy yeah. Where'd my guy go? Like, <laughs> and I mean, and that's, that's all in the, the theme of, you know, getting better. I, I understand that, but that, that shuffling, you know, I, I'm, it's incredible. We made it to the, uh, to the playoffs. I'm just, I'm serious. And, you know, we, we had a decent roster. I don't, I don't think it was really that great. I know that draft was special that 2010, uh, Oakham, Earl Thomas, Golden Tate. Um, try to think who, I don't know his third, Walter Thurman, Cam Chancellor, um, Dexter Davis, James Cons, EJ Wilson. I mean, those, those were, they were all players. And the the three that you probably don't remember, they all got hurt. Wilson, Cons, and um, and Davis. And they all got hurt. That's the only reason they didn't make it, because they got hurt. And um, so I mean, it was it was uh, it was crazy. We were doing a bunch of stuff on defense too. It, it was wild, man. 
But, um, you know, we had a number one offense when uh, in 05. And then it, I don't know where our ranking was in, um, in 10. But I think the biggest thing was, was John going and getting uh, Marshawn Lynch was like, I mean, that first game, we came back, first game we got him. Guy doesn't even know any of the plays. They, you know, he goes into, I think he has one day of practice. And yeah, one day of practice. And they're like, yo, you're going to run zone right? You're going to run zone left. And he's like, okay, throw a power in too. Like he told him to do Because he's a power back. And yeah. I mean, it's no surprise that his biggest runs were off the power. Uh, because there's, there's not a lot of running backs that can do both. That can, can run zone, read it right, read it correctly, and also just run downhill. Um, but Marshawn, and I mean, we beat the Bears because we traded for Marshawn that week. <laughs> so, and then of course we beat the Saints because he's quick. But um, but I mean, it was it, it was it was a tight team, but it was it was tough to stay tight when mm -hmm. there were so many transactions and um, and you know there was so many injuries too. Um, we we shuffled a lot of guys. Guy coming off the street, you know, hey, you're starting this week. Like, man. So it was incredible that we were able to make it to the playoffs. You know, I know seven and nine wasn't wasn't the prettiest, but you know, we showed that we did belong because we, we beat the defending champs and um who we lost to earlier in the year. So I mean, there was uh, there was a lot of a lot of differences in the two teams, um, uh, you know, to answer your question. Oh yeah. No, I think I think you hit you hit it right on the head there. Uh, being able to make it to the playoffs alone is it just a testament you know just I mean so many shuffling pieces I'm sure you know as that middle linebacker say hey you know who, who, who am I looking at on the rest of my defense here when someone just he's gone you know like you said the guy next to me yeah the different we, name in the locker room well we had we had like a top three or four Russian defense until like week six and Colin Cole went down Red Bryant went down Somebody else got hurt too. And so, you know, we were running like a, like a hybrid three, four, which, you know, it was not for the linebackers we had, it was not really conducive. You, you need to have a, you need to have some six, three, 260 pound linebackers to two gap. We were doing it with like me, Hawthorne, uh, Leroy, <laughs> like, um, so, and, you know, we're, we're more downhill shoot, shoot gap, you know, one gap penetration and, you know, tackles for loss. So we kind of stayed into that, you know, even with the injuries because, okay, well, it was working. But when you got different pieces in there, when you don't have Colin Cole, 3, 320, Red Bryant, 315, yeah. like that, there's a big difference in that line of scrimmage push. And, uh, you know, it's, it is what it is, but uh, we, we did the best we could. I think, I think it worked out pretty decently well. I mean, that uh, to, to beat the defending champs in anything, you know, they still have those, you know, it's not like they, I don't remember how many guys, if they lost too many guys that off season before, but, you know, it's to win a playoff game, you know, at seven and nine, you know, obviously the Bears went on to play. I believe they played the Packers in that NFC championship game. Um, yeah, if we could have just, just beat the Bears. We would have had the Packers at home. Oh shit, you're right. <laughs> yeah, if we could have, and you know, we beat the Bears earlier in the year, um, but you know, they did a good job adjusting. And um, oh yeah, and, you know, I think they was a game of adjustments. You know, and yeah, and then a, a week, you know, when you get that bye week, that's crucial. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's wild to think though, seven and nine, and we were over we the fifth, we were the fourth seed. We would have had the fifth or sixth seed, whatever Green Bay was that year, we would have them at home for the NFC championship. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, it's nothing, it's obviously nothing to spit at, you know, seven and nine make the playoffs. I mean, you, you do what you can, you know, whatever mm -hmm. way you can make it. Um, so getting back to kind of, I think we talked about a little bit uh, from when we were talking about uh, your first game in, uh, what, who, who would you identify as the hardest player to tackle throughout your career if you had to pick one? I mean, that's tough. Um, I I always Fred Taylor was no joke. I mean, I mean the guy could do whatever he wanted, whether 
outrun you, make you break your ankles with a juke move. He had a vicious like hesitation spin, which even if you did get a piece of him, you didn't get enough of him because you could spin off of it. And then he was going to outrun you. So I, I got to go with Freddie T. There, there was, I mean, with Danny and Tomlinson, there were so many of them really, but Fred T, I'd say, if, you know, just consistently, if you had to continually try to tackle that guy, it's going to be a long day. Um, you know, and, and look, all due respect to Marshawn, I played Marshawn once. He was a rookie in, in Buffalo. Yeah. He went for like 120 on us. Uh, you know, I think he broke like a 40 yarder up the middle on like third and one. Um, we came with an all out blitz. Um, but, you know, I'm only not saying Marshawn because then he was my teammate. But I mean, the stuff that we watched him do, I mean, it was incredible. Um, so he, he's up there in that list, man. Um, but yeah, Fred Taylor. I don't know if it was just because it was my first game that guy was just making everyone look bad. But uh, then I watched more of his tape, you know, and he was he was doing it to everybody all across the league. I mean, Fred Fred never got the respect he deserved. If you look at his numbers, they're they're up there Hall of Fame worthy. And, oh yeah. Uh, hopefully he gets in one day. Um, pardon me if I'm incorrect, but he, he played with the Jags, right? Yeah, yeah. So that maybe it's that just because you know Jags don't yeah. get as much attention, you know. But Fred Taylor, I've always kind of known about Fred Taylor, you know, thinking about great running backs. Obviously, LTs was up there, and next year he broke uh, Sean's touchdown oh, record. But you know, I mean, when you're at that level, you know, so, some people don't always see uh the talent just because they don't their name I mean, doesn't get set a bunch in the west alone we had sean you know luckily he was on our team with that offensive line uh frank gore oh, God. Ed, ed james was was in arizona and then uh, steven jackson who you know when steve came in that that line that was that amazing line that um you know marshall falk who was unbelievable um they were they started to get a little older and they were losing some pieces too and so Steve was doing a lot of that work on his own. And I mean he's he's no guy to spit at either trying to tackle I'm sure. No, he got me in college once. <laughs> uh, with that being said about guys that might have been hardest, do you had a did you have a favorite player to tackle or or hit? No, not really. Not a, I didn't matter who it was. I just enjoyed hitting. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, kind of a flip side to tackling, uh, you know, it was always cool to think about those Philly games, but looking into it more, I had somehow 2007 had been wiped from my brain. How did, how did, what do you attribute your knack for the ball to, you know, I mean, 10 career interceptions, 39 career pass deflections. How, where does that, where would you say that came from? I, I lost you there for a second. I didn't get any of that. Oh, sorry. Um, I was going to ask you, how did you, where did you attribute uh, the, the knack for playing the ball in the air with the, you know, 10 career interception, 39 career pass deflections? Where would, where did you say that came from? Um, you know, it's, it's something that I think most players, they develop instinctually when they're younger. You know, I, I think, you know, even in Pop Warner, I was making interceptions, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, high school, you know, I had, two or three each year in college. I had, I had 10 in the two and a half years. I got to start three at Maine and seven in at um, USC. I did play some quarterback. So I think that kind of helps with uh, rhythm and timing of routes and where the quarterback's looking, his shoulders. Those are little things that I picked up on from being a quarterback, but honestly, basketball probably was, you know, and I'm not saying I was not good at basketball, but I, I could play defense. No matter what we're in, football, baseball, or basketball, I can play <laughs> some defense for you. So it was just about knowing where your man is in relation to, you know, the ball. And so it's very similar in terms of finding lanes and knowing when the ball is going to get thrown. And so I, I bet you a lot of guys that, you know, have the knack for getting interceptions, I bet they're good at basketball, defensively anyways. And that's, I don't know how their shot is, uh, but – it's, it's that how quickly, you know, discerning the time and the amount of time you have to break and intercept the angle of the pass, uh, which is why they call it an interception, and, you know, just going for it. You know, I think that's the difference when you see a playmaker um, and then other guys that are just 
uh, they, they're fast, but they're just a step too slow because they didn't trust their instincts. And that you just some you just develop. And I mean, um, you know, I, but I would say basketball is probably what helped me the most because it, it happens so quick in basketball. Like you're, you're head back and forth, ping pong, ping pong, you know, ball to your guy, ball to the guy, ball. And then as soon as you see it, you go to break. And uh, in football, learning to get in position and treat it the same, um, I think a lot, the guys that it comes natural to, you see they, they have just a, a knack for making the big play. And so I think that's where it came from. Did, mm, I'm going to go to my assistant linebackers uh, question here. How was your time doing that? Because you mentioned a little bit, you know, uh, trying to get the defense a little bit motivated linebackers uh, with getting the turnover. But how was that experience uh, for you? And if the opportunity presented itself, would you ever consider coaching again? Or has that just been, you know, I'm done with that. That was a one time thing. Uh, no, it, it was awesome. And I mean, you know, get the coach. KJ and Bobby, like, are you kidding me? I mean, two of the greatest to ever put on that uniform. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was fun, you know, to be back around football. Um, I loved every second of it, but I didn't want to be doing a disservice. One to my family, my kids, I got two little ones. Well, now they're not so little 10 and six, but at the time they were, um, uh, what, uh, six and three. So, you know, it's, um, you know, that's the biggest thing is it is some serious commitment, some long hours. And, you know, and speaking of don't want to do a disservice, you can't, if your heart's not in it, you can't do it because you don't want to rob, you know, KJ and Bobby of, of their prime years of, of chasing that ring. And, and see, that's why I did it. I, I said, I figured if, you know, I can't get a ring playing, I'm going to get a ring coaching <laughs> because that's the only thing I was missing and in my in my eyes, if I had won the Super Bowl as a rookie, I, I would have been like, you know what? If I don't ever play again, I'm fine. Yeah. Because that's that's all I wanted was that Super Bowl ring. Because especially coming off of a national championship or two national championships, it's when you once you get that hunger and that appetite for winning, oh, yeah. there there's nothing that can replace it. It's just it's it's what you do. It's how you operate. And so, um, but. And that was what was cool was coming back and being a part of it um, in some way, shape or form, coaching them. Um, incredible watching Bobby and KJ and, you know, just just the most amazing consummate professionals. They they, they, they do it right, man. Um, and that's why they've had such success, sustained success uh, over over a decade now. Hopefully we get KJ back here, you know, hopefully today. I don't know. That'd be nice. That'd be nice to have that, you know, pop on my phone. Right. Um, if I were to have to put you on the spot and ask for your Mount Rushmore of Seahawks linebackers across, across the organization's history, if you had to pick four, could you pick four? I don't think I could, man. I mean, okay. Bobby, right. I mean, do you have, do you have four? What's your four? Ah, shoot. I'd, I'd have to say, you know, Bobby and KJ and you were up, up on that three, but it gets kind of difficult, you know, just because I've always, I've always liked seeing linebackers play, you know, I don't know why I was a DB when I played, so it doesn't really make that much sense. But I mean, just thinking about guys like Julian Peterson, you know, who I'm sure you, you know, mm -hmm. um, and even, even back, oop, wrong side with this logo, you know, there were guys to think about. So I, I it's, it's tough. You know, but um, I'm gonna go. Man, that's tough. I'm gonna go Bobby, KJ, Julian, Chad Brown. Yeah, when I think about this logo and linebackers, Chad Brown's who I think about. You know, yeah. it's it is tough though. You know, so yeah. I, I don't know. You if got you Porter, had... Beeson. You know, you got some 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 serious Fred Young. Fred Young was a bad dude. Um, so, I mean, yeah. KJ, Bobby, Julian, Chad Brown. Final answer. Speaking about those two guys, you know, Bobby and KJ, um, I remember when they came out, people had their own opinions on them. Um, but would you have wanted to play, just, just speaking, not necessarily about the teams or, you know, where the organization was at, 
the uniform itself, would you have wanted to play in the current uniform or were you okay more with the one that you wore? Oh yeah. I love the switch. It, you know, you got to shake things up every now and then. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, the old one was nice. I thought it was, you know, an upgrade from, right. Just like when we got those, everybody was like, Ooh, because I remember seeing them on Madden before I ever got to like wear them. <laughs> like back when I was in college, I was like, Oh, those are pretty, those are pretty, you know, sleek. And, uh, and then, but now, of course, what do we want to do? We all want to go back to the the old one, right? The silver helmets and the and the silver pants. You know, we wouldn't wouldn't mind seeing that. But um, but I, I really I like the new the new threads. Yeah, no, that's uh, I think I think I read that the the NFL was going to talk about helmet rule this off season, and that could I keep pointing to the wrong. Oh, this is the right side. Uh, <laughs> that would obviously you know play into that, and I'm sure I don't know if there's any contractual rights. I think it was. I don't know if Reebok had the rights to these ones, but you know, that would obviously people have clamored for it for a while, but um, I just remember when the, those uniforms came out, you know, there was kind of like, Oh, they're too much. Like, you know, how Oregon does theirs or whatever. I was like, I don't know. I, I've always enjoyed them. Oh, actually speaking about uniforms, I want to hear your thoughts on the green, the highlighter green, because I remember back before the, the Nike ones, there was a highlighter green of sorts for that one game. And then that was done away with. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on the newer ones? The, the action green has grown on me and it's probably grown on me because I think we've only lost like one game in them. Like, I think we're like 12 and one or something like that uh, since wearing them. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I like, it looks a lot nicer. I mean, back then it was, it was the blue pants with the green. It mm -hmm. wasn't all, it wasn't, and it was a different green too. I yeah. think. So um, definitely, I like the new ones. They've grown on me. What would you say that the organization at this point means to you? Cause obviously, you know, spend most of your career, except for the, uh, I, I think it was training camp with the Falcons, you know, mm -hmm. and then you've done some events. Um, I believe there was a vir virtual uh, draft party you did. Um, and just some other stuff, you know, for the organization, what does it mean to you, you know, to still be involved and just overall, um, what, what kind of place is Seattle, the Seattle Seahawks, what do they hold in your heart? Oh man, it, the, the organization, the city is always going to have a place in my heart. It's, it's special, man. I was extremely fortunate and blessed to, to get drafted to such a place. Um, I didn't know I was going to fall in love with the city the way I did. Um, and you know, I, I think it's probably not only because of how gorgeous it is, but the way the fans and the 12s really, you know, they support the team, man. I remember, and I tell the story all the time. It's like, it's easy to cheer for, for your favorite team when they're winning, right? When they're going to Super Bowls or, you know, like my first three years. But in 08 and 09, we had two just terrible, just dismal years. That place was still sold out. And I mean, and rocking. And I mean... And so that's what really, you know, when we, you know, we see a lot of people say, oh, we got the best fans. I mean, well, is your stadium still sold out when your team's got four wins? Because I know for a fact that ours was. And, um, you know, that, I think that stays truer to, to their character and how much, how much passion they have for ball and the team. And then as far as the organization, I mean, started by the man himself, you know, uh, God rest his soul, you know, Paul Allen. I mean, I don't think there was any better leader that I could imagine from his, you know, how I think over a billion in, in charitable, you know, um, donations. And then also just what he's done and meant for the community, saving football for Seattle, but also, you know, really pouring everything into Seattle in terms mm -hmm. of, um, you know, who he is as a person. And that's, it trickles down from the top, man. That's why, you see the Hawks doing all, all these these um, community-based events and, and giving back. And I'm grateful that they, they still include me. So I want to take a step away from football here and talk about something that has a relation to what you're wearing right now. Uh, zone in. I mean, I remember when I met you, uh, you were wearing the hoodie, obviously, but how did, how did that all come to be? And, you know, did somebody approach you about it or did you do your own research? How did that come to be? Um, yeah, what was the origin origin story for you? Yeah, no, I, I started Zone in CBD is my my company, hemp based products, um, and um, 
I, you know, I started it 2018 when the farm bill passed and um, it's, I've been using CBD for going on five years now. And so it was something that I was heavily interested in um, because it's really, it's brought me full circle from, as we know, the first few years of my career started off great. And then, you know, the last three or four, just, I was battling just to get back to full strength and football, as much as I loved it, 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 it gave me eight of my 10 surgeries, 15 plus concussions. And, um, every year I just felt less and less like myself. And so, you know, fortunately I say this now, looking back, I tore my other pack, um, in Atlanta and it was pretty much just it. I mean, I had a couple, you know, tryouts or workouts for teams after that, but you know, I had really kind of come to terms with that. My career was ending because I just couldn't, I couldn't be myself out there. I couldn't be Lofa anymore um, that, that everybody remembered. And that's just, that's one of those sad realizations that, you know, it comes by the time gets everybody. It's going to get Tom Brady, believe it or not, one of these days. Eventually. Yeah. But it, but it's also, you know, it's kind of like he said, you know, his, one of his greatest quotes was, you know, I've given up my life for this. What are, you know, what are you ready to sacrifice? And I mean, with all the body parts and, you know, even, everything that, that I've sacrificed. It's, um, you know, it was fun while it lasted, but life after ball was, it was tough. Like I literally, my last game, they carried me off the field um, because me and Julius Jones collided head first, both had a concussion. And um, so when I say I left it all out there, I really did. <laughs> and uh, the only thing that put me back together, you know, I went, I followed the doctor's you know, advice with vitamins and a regiment of working out and everything and eating right. And it just didn't, it never stuck. It never, I never felt better. I never felt like the fog was lifted from my brain. And if you don't, if anything, life's taught us anything, especially these day and age, if you don't have mental health, if you don't have that, you don't have anything. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care. You don't have your mental health. You're not going to have your physical health because you're not gonna respect yourself enough to take care of yourself. And, uh, you know, so for a long time, I was just, you know, sleepwalking through the next four or five years of my life. Luckily, football was something I was always good at. So I really feel like I did do a good job coaching. I didn't sleepwalk through that, you know, for all the 12s out there listening. But um, man, I mean, I, I got up to about 280 pounds. My playing weight was 235. I'm back to 235 now. And I've held this weight for the last four years. So it's not, it's not a fad. It's not a trend. CBD is the future of health and wellness and it's here to stay. And so three years before I started zoning CBD, I was just buying bulk, you know, CBD oil and handing it out to friends and family. And because, you know, everybody, when they see you, right. And they're like, oh my God, like you're back in playing shape. Like, you know, and you know, they, they see me running, playing with my kids, you know, back dunking a basketball. They're just like, you know, you trying to play again? I'm like, no. I'm like, I just feel it's a reflection of how I feel. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, it was just an, an, an awakening of sorts and realizing that I didn't know life could be this good, man. I'm going to tell you that right now. I had a lot of good years. The last four of them, the last five have been the greatest years of my life. And so with that, I put the company in, in motion to, you know, just – be a loudspeaker and, and, you know, um, you know, dispel the myths about what, even we named it zone in to fight the stigma. Cause when you say hemp, everyone's like, Oh, weed or marijuana. Yeah. And you're just like, no, cause there's a lot of education still needs to be had. It's like, yes, it is. It is a cannabis plant, but the difference between hemp and cannabis is the varying amounts of THC. Everybody knows those, those three letters. So, um, you know, it's just uh, trying to trying to fight the stigma and, and let people know that this is the future of health and wellness and only you can can fix you. I mean, like I said, uh, I took everything they told me to take what, you know, anti-inflammatories. The I, I was on sleep meds. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, and then um, vitamin C, vitamin D, glucosamine, chondroitin, all these regiment of you know, um, supplements that were supposed to like repair the mind body connection, mm -hmm. at least lift the fog. 
now, man, I didn't do it. But within a week of taking CBD oil, within a week, I felt, I felt like I was back. And I mean, sleeping better, waking up, well rested, like ready to attack the day. I mean, it was insane what it's done. And so that's, that's why, you know, most of you start a company because a company can, you know, you have, you can address a need in the world. And if, if, if you had five hours, I could go through all the, the things that this has addressed in my life, but, you know, to save you, you know, the time, I'm just saying, um, it's, uh, it's here to stay. And, you know, I can't wait for the NFL to really ad adapt it and just say, Hey, you know, we're fine. You've seen a lot of other, like the hockey M MLB, they've lifted it. They're like, yeah, it's fine. And uh, because it, it really is, it's medicine. It yeah. really is. So with that being said, um, I was going to ask you, it's not, if, if it's listed on the website, I apologize. I missed it. But do you guys have any plans for a physical location uh, mm -hmm. to sell product or? Well, we're in a lot of retail. So yep. like Bartel Drugs, we're in all 67 stores there. Um, some chiropractors and some some gyms around the area where we're in. Um, so your baby steps, right? It's still oh, startup yeah. life. It's still startup life, man. So, uh, but we did just come out with uh, a new product literally yesterday. It's it's on the site now. It's an energy mix, and um, you know because everybody another you know myth is that CBD is just for sleep. It's not. Uh, high doses of it will have a sedative effect, you know, bringing your mood down, bringing, you know, so that's why everybody claims it's for sleep and anxiety. Yes, it will help with that. But in small increments, small doses, such as 5, 10, 20 milligrams, there's, there's a mental clarity aspect that comes with it. You know, a zone in, a focus and zone in kind of, uh, you know, uh, moment of clarity. And um, that just kind of lifts the fog and, and lets you, uh, you know, do your thing. So, um, yeah, but the, the energy powder, it's, it's got, um, you know, 3000 milligrams of vitamin C, vitamin D it's got a vitamin B complex for a more improved focus. Um, a, what else? They're, they're, yeah, it's, it's incredible, man. And it's, um, we call it energy plus. It's kind of like a hybrid. I don't know if you ever taken pre-workout or anything, but it, there's no jitters and no crash. So, and that's the only thing I, I love pre-workout, but I can't stand like my ears burning and my face tingling. Yeah. And then also three and a half, you know, three hours later, you just fall off the cliff, like in terms of, you know, just your energy, you just depleted. So this one, it's, uh, you know, I, I take one at like five every morning and, and I'm good. No jitters, no crash until like three o'clock. So, yeah, no, I always, whenever I do these, I always want to focus on some that's not necessarily on the field, you know, and seeing that and obviously seeing the logo when you had it at the time, I didn't know what it was. I was like, whoa, that's cool, you know, but I definitely wanted to, you know, focus on that. And, you know, like you said, baby steps. I remember seeing uh, the post about Bartels. And obviously, that's going to be really cool, but uh, I really do have, appreciate having you on, you know, and it's, the point of these is always to get, you know, the athlete or the athletic figure talking. I don't want to be the one. I'm not supposed to be the star of this, you know, and I always really hear, enjoy hearing the stories and learn more about these sports that, you know, you, I grew up playing. I'm obviously, you know, not going pro or anything, but it's always good, you know, to learn and just really appreciate the knowledge you got. So I want to thank you for coming on. Um, that's, that's all I've got to say, unless you've got anything that you want to put, I know I'm kind of pushing you for time right now. So. Oh no. Yeah, we're good. I got about yeah five minutes left, uh, but yeah, man, no, I appreciate you. This is a lot of fun. And uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Thank you.